yes, so I was thinking that we could talk about the university system today, maybe, because <clears throat> I have just decided recently that I will stop going to university because um, basically there is too much uh, things that you have to do just in order to get credit points. So I like these uh, assignments that are not really meant to create something really good, but just as an exercise that is then intended to be thrown away after it is completed. So there is a lot of stuff that you have to do. At least that's how I experience it. That is, for example, we have to write uh, some thesis, but we, but they are not intended to really that you really develop some new idea. It's just basically an exercise in writing. And so, yeah, I think it's a pity. I, I heard somewhere that, uh, you know, in past times, they were discussing great ideas in university. And now uh, I think it's really no longer the case. People are, the, the, the things that people are looking at, they keep getting smaller and smaller. And so, yeah, I'm quite dissatisfied with that. And so I think I will, I will get out of university. Right, I see. So um, sort of what would be your plan now uh, with regards to, to philosophy and stuff like that? You will sort of try to study things on your own by reading books or how, how do you think that uh, you will do that? Yes, um, my, my plan is actually, uh, I have a couple of, of ideas. So one is I am, I have a project I'm currently writing on a book and I will uh, read books that are kind of important to this subject. And I will also, I will continue to use uh, the university as a source of information because I think there is actually a lot of very good knowledge and good information there. It's just the whole system that you have to go through in order to get a bachelor or a master. It's so rigid that it's basically, there is a lot of, of uh, stuff that I would just have to do without it being of any value other than allowing me to progress towards getting this degree. But I will still, for example, look at the university curriculum and if there is a, a, a lecture that I find particularly interesting towards what I'm trying to understand, then I will visit this lecture just as a visitor. So I will not get any credit points for it, but I can still listen to the lecture and absorb the knowledge, which is sometimes really very good and very refined. But it's this whole credit point system, which is for me a big problem. Right. Yes, that's uh, that's understandable. Um, I remember myself in a public school system, uh, sort of similar tendencies there as well, that there's a lot of things that we simply had to go through because that was the system, even though it seemed very uh, meaningless or boring, to put it that way. Um, and yes, uh, it seems that also in university, there is this tendency, at least with with having lots of things that you have to go through that aren't really that productive to the whole issue. But um, yeah, it seems that the university has been worsened in that regard over time, because I imagine that if you go back in the past, universities were more oriented toward ideas and, and philosophies. I might be wrong, but that's at least my impression that before uh, in, 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 in the past, it was better. But yeah, uh, at least it seems that the, that's a problem with, uh, with the university that you are going through. And, I, and it's also a credit point system here in uh, the University of Oslo, where I'm going. 
I'm not sure if it's exactly identical, but at least one can see the same sort of tendency. Yeah. Yes. I, I think you, you mentioned the, the, the public school system, and I think it's a very uh, important parallel because I was just reminded about this general uh, feeling in, in public school, which is everybody has to do exactly the same. And so you may have, I don't know, 20 kids in your class, in your classroom, and two of them can already add and subtract perfectly well, but they have to do the same exercises as the other 10 who maybe cannot add and subtract at all. So each gets the same set of problems, like this, these stacks of just uh, add two plus five, add six plus three, add one plus one and so on. And you just have to, to fill it out. Um, it's always oriented. Um, based basically on the slowest of the whole class. And then it's just, well, everybody has to do the same thing. And it's of course completely stupid to have some kids who already know how to add and subtract, just keep repeating the same simple exercises just because some other kids haven't understood how it's done yet. But I think this is a, a, a kind of very good uh, synonym of what I feel now on a higher level in, in university. So, and also I think a big problem is this, and I don't have a good solution for it, I have to admit that, um, so you want to give someone a diploma which basically says this person is competent in a certain field, let's say philosophy. But then how, how will you measure if this person is competent in philosophy? So one example, which is maybe more the, the, the authority way to do it is you have some authority like a professor and this professor has uh, conversations with the students and he says, ah, oh, this student, he is very sharp, he is very fast and this other student, uh, he is not so good yet. He still has to do some more reading. But this, of course, opens the door to a lot of corruption or possibilities for corruption. Because maybe someone could just bribe the professor or go to bed with him or whatever, and then get a diploma, even though uh, they are not very well uh, educated in philosophy at all. And of course, some people might also protest and, and sue the university and say, hey, uh, I'm just as good in all of these classes as this other guy, but he gets a better mark than me. And so uh, how, can you, how can you defend your uh, grading? And then there is no really objective measurable thing that the university can point to, to say, well, that's why you get a worse grade than this other person. But if you make everything very rigid and you just say, okay, um, basically repeat the most important concepts from the first chapter of Aristotle's politics, then you actually have an answer that you can measure if it's correct or not. And so then you can grade the students if they correctly answered so and so many questions and therefore give them credit points and therefore have kind of an objectively verifiable degree. But the problem is you eliminate all of the, the actual thinking and the actual philosophy and, and really, yeah, dealing with, with the ideas as such and not just basically memorizing and, and collecting points. Right, it sounds almost like uh, the subject of philosophy becomes history of philosophy. <laughs> yes, those yes, are... very much. Exactly, and those are two two different subjects, but uh, one might risk just making the other into the uh, the one into the other, and that's that's of course problematic indeed. Yes, and I think the the deeper question here is the question of what the purpose of philosophy is. Because when you're talking about being truly competent in philosophy, well, that presupposes that there is an understanding of a specific end or purpose or goal for a philosopher in society. 
And it seems that the, the, the university system doesn't have a very clear and, and well-defined end or purpose, uh, a standard that we could judge what is competent philosophy and what is not competent philosophy. Um, and, and some people might be confused and say, well, perhaps the end of philosophy is just to know about the, the great philosophers like Aristotle or Plato or, or Immanuel Kant. But then you just have history of philosophy, which is not exactly the same thing as philosophy itself. Uh, so, yeah, I think there needs to be a great deal of clarity about the end of philosophy and then hopefully try to, to find out based on that uh, what counts as competence and what does not count as competence. So I suppose if we're going to talk about philosophy as being the ability to think, to reflect, to understand abstract concepts, um, that would seem more like true philosophy. However, to measure that might, as you implied there, that might be problematic as well, because how do you judge whether a person is good to reflect and not reflect? Uh, I mean, I suppose, one, one could say, of course, that uh, yes, you can, you can objectively find out whether a person is good to reflect compared to other persons. But at the same time, uh, if you're going to put a, a sort of a number on how good a specific person is uh, and, and give him points based on the, his ability to, to think, well, that's a challenge. At least it sounds like a challenge. <laughs> yes, yes. <clears throat> I think you brought up some very good points because uh, especially at the one or two. One was the history of philosophy versus actually doing philosophy, which is, I think this just sums up very nicely my experience of studying philosophy at university. It was, it was only about history of philosophy. There was no really actually doing philosophy yourself. So I have great respect for the great thinkers of the past, but still I want to discuss is Aristotle actually right when he says this or that? Is it actually right what he says? Or is it not right? Or why would you support this theory? And why wouldn't you support the other theory? So I want to actually discuss the ideas and not just uh, who said what. In, because in the end, I don't really care who said something, but I care, is it actually correct or not? And I didn't really find a place where this is so much uh, done in in this in this year that I was now studying at this university and so yeah I, I feel like it's not not the right place for me and the second thing that you brought up that I think is is very crucial is this question of what is actually the purpose maybe also of a university not just the purpose of philosophy, but also what is the purpose of university? What, what function does a university serve in society? And so I have just uh, had a phone call with my, with my parents yesterday, and my father basically said, well, the purpose of university isn't to produce anything great. It's just to basically teach people how to think more or less coherently so that they can do something useful for society. But I, in, if that's actually true, then the universities are probably doing quite a fine job at the moment because they are not really uh, producing great new theories, but they are just um, creating a big output of people who can maybe think or articulate themselves and then go out into the workforce. But I actually think that that is the task of school to create people who can think halfway coherently or articulate themselves. And the task of university would actually be to discuss great ideas and to work on the very important, very big or biggest questions imaginable. And so in that sense, I think it's not doing its job at all at the moment or not very, not very well, I would say. Right, right. So in practice, it, the university is more concerned about how to earn credentials <laughs> and points instead of actually being able to, to think. And that seems to be a general critique of, of a university, the, the university system. 
that's a, that's a very good um, good question uh, or, or or point. So um, I suppose um, then the question becomes well. The, the, the ability to think and reflect and philosophize must somehow be connected to producing efficient results in society, some people would argue, because university is, of course, expensive, it costs money to do such things, and people usually want to, have a, to, to pursue a career so that that is at focus for them. So I suppose people would, at least some people would say that, well, the university must concern itself with, with those things because otherwise it wouldn't be worth the costs of uh, operating a university. So that's perhaps a, a, a challenge, one could say. Yes, and I guess maybe we, we found an important problem here, which is the fact that the state funds the university through tax money, because then exactly what you said is exactly what is going to happen, that people will say, hey, I'm paying for this thing. I want to see some return. I want this university to produce something useful for me as a citizen of this society. So why is, why is there someone studying Aristotle if this doesn't directly provide me any benefit, at least in the next five to 10 years, then we can just cut that and do something else which is useful. And I think there is, of course, uh, a great importance to doing useful things. But there is also, I think, an importance to have a place where you can talk about ideas really, really deeply and trying to really go to the core of, of things and try to understand how the world or society works or how it should be structured or very big questions that you can't just say, ah, yes, uh, we have like a great progressive plan and we know what will come out of it at the end. And so perhaps if the university would be completely privately funded or just people come together in the evening after they have done their work to talk about ideas, maybe like, like the Greeks did in the very beginning, they would just meet in the marketplace and talk about important ideas, then that would, I think this aspect is missing at the moment somewhere in our society. Right, yes, yes. I, I think the, the possibility of, of just encouraging and, and in, initiating such philosophical activity isn't really that difficult. I can imagine that they, you have a classroom and you have a teacher who just starts the class by asking the students or pupils questions about life or reality or religion or whatever, and, and thereby make the students think. So I, I think to just start a conversation which would make them think it's not really that difficult. And you mentioned ancient Greece, where, it's, where it seems like people just went up to the marketplace and began talking and discussing. Um, so I think there's a real possibility for both the, 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 the lower forms of education and the higher forms of education, that is university, to just encourage people to, to engage in uh, some sort of dialogue or uh, personal thinking, to, to come up with some um, suggestions or answers to specific philosophical um, questions. So that is so that can sort of help to, to to promote exactly that that you set the tone for the class or course by having these questions. And instead of just saying, "Well, this person answered that," Plato answered this to that question. Immanuel Kant said this to the question. Instead, you 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 leave it out to the students. You leave the question to the students so that they will um, respond and and come up with suggestions. Yes, yes, I agree. And I think exactly if you would ask very deep and interesting questions, then you might find a couple of students who would bring extraordinary and very refreshing uh, answers to these questions. Like, I always find it so, um, uh, it's almost, it's really funny, actually, 
that, um, for example, Rousseau, his first uh, treatise, which is very famous still and, and often read and discussed, this was an essay that he wrote that some, some prize question at university where you could put in your essay and maybe the first place got, uh, got some prize money. And the question was, did uh, the arts and science improve humans and uh, basically our ethics and society? And his answer was no, they didn't. But this is such a great big question. If I wanted to write today a thesis about this question in university, it would completely be impossible. They would answer me, well, this topic is even too big for a doctoral thesis. So you're only allowed to look at really small things, but you always read this great literature from the past where people looked at big questions. So it's, it's very paradoxical to me, yeah. Yes, and that also brought in another thought that um, how people answer or try to answer specific philosophical questions um, are dependent upon their philosophical views on other things. If you have a philosophy class and the teacher comes up with this question about how do you live a good life uh, and, and the students try to answer, they would probably say something that presuppose a lot of philosophical assumptions as we talked about earlier, that you have people who uh, have some political opinion and without perhaps realizing it, have a lot of philosophical premises at bottom to presuppose that political opinion. So I suppose if you're really going to, to encourage real philosophical productive dialogue and conversation and, and make it really, really productive, then you have to really go to the deep presuppositions or premises that people have. Um, and, and that's perhaps an, an argument for why philosophy must concern itself with metaphysics and not just start with say political philosophy because then people might just yeah. say things like, well, how should you live a good life? Well, that's uh, relative, that's subjective. Morality is just uh, um, something that you decide for yourself and, and, and then stop there. And I sadly, I imagine that a great deal of people, perhaps the vast majority of people would answer something like that if they're asked a question about morality. And therefore it seems that in order to make the conversation be truly productive, we have to dig deeper and, and talk about, well, the subjectivity or objectivity or morality, that is the question at hand. How do we ground moral values? How do we understand the relationship between ethics and reality and, and, and go deeper into the metaphysics itself? Uh, what do you think of this? Yes, yes, I agree. And, and I think this is exactly then maybe the task of the teacher in this setting. The teacher is actually the one that that keeps asking the questions that go deeper, that go, okay, well, what's at the basis of this statement? Aha, so there is a presupposition in here. So maybe where does this pre presupposition come from? And so on. So I, I think the, as you said, the teacher could start by asking questions and then the students would maybe give some answer. And then the teacher could continue by asking more questions that go deeper into the subject and thereby make uh, the people who are taking part in this conversation think more deeply about the basis of their beliefs and values. Right, exactly. So, so uh, therefore make them think through their, their own presuppositions because it is a fact that everyone is born in a specific culture and family and society and have some presuppositions that they have learned from the environment around them. So, so all students will have some worldview uh, at, at the basis. And, and that sort of seems to, in order to have a productive conversation that must be challenged by promoting this, this, um, this deepening of the conversation, if that's a useful term. And here it seems to be useful to, to include uh, perhaps courses and, and, and teachings about logic and things like logical fallacy, what is, what is a valid argument, what is a valid syllogism, what is an invalid or unsound argument, um, because I think that's really important in order to make students 
distinguish good arguments from bad arguments, good logic versus bad logic to identify logical fallacies, uh, which are of course very important in order to define the truth. So uh, I, I don't know if, if you have had um, courses in, in logic when you, you have been here in, in university, but at least it seems to be re related to the whole philosophy course. So I think that is important to recognize, yeah. Yes, uh, I would I would definitely agree that it it would then be important to to get uh, more familiar with, as you said, correct arguments or or correct logical structures of arguments that make then a valid argument, and also be uh, be informed or be knowledgeable about the incorrect styles of arguments. So the logical fallacies or just the appeal to emotion or the different other kinds of arguments that people often use, but which are actually not, um, not valid logical arguments, but they, they work through other mechanisms. So yes, I, I agree there. I was thinking um, maybe we have to kind of, or, or I would, I would probably like to to try more to to bring this kind of this kind of school of philosophy back, like create more um, settings where where this old way of of really just talking about the important questions can can reappear. So if it's not being done in the university and the university is becoming more and more just a factory for uh, credentials and knowledge that can then be used for some productive means, then we might want to try to create uh, a new arena where this uh, just having conversations about the deep questions can really take place. So maybe what do you think? How, how could this be done? Following this part of our conversation, uh, Christopher and I discussed about how such an arena could actually be set up for people to meet and have deep philosophical conversations. And we came to the conclusion that we should set up a Discord server where we would just try that out if, if people are interested. If you watch this video and you are interested, then you can join our Discord server. The link is in the description of this video. And then we will try to regularly schedule uh, philosophical conversations where we will just pick a deep and important philosophical question and then discuss it and try to come ever closer to the truth. So if you are interested, then please join our Discord server. We would be very happy to get to know you and have uh, interesting conversations with you there. Okay, goodbye.